Thank you very much, Hakan, and uh, thank you to everyone who's come out. Um, so I, my talk today is Sex and the Stacks, which is perhaps a bit ambiguous or um, uh, leaves room for, for multiple interpretations because it's uh, a bit sexier than the, the subtitle, which is Finding Materials on Gender and Sexuality in the Middle Eastern Collections of the British Library, which should give you a, a greater uh, idea as to what we're going to talk about today. Um, as Hakan has said, I, my specialty is more in historiography and sort of early um, 20th century uh, publishing in, in Turkey and the uh, Central Asia, Soviet Central Asia. And um, that I've come to this topic and particularly come to this sort of um, uh, these themes uh, through my work at the British Library and through uh, attempts at building a greater uh, a more comprehensive collection of materials about sexuality, about gender, uh, and about related issues that come particularly from Turkey, but also from other Turkic countries uh, for researchers in the United Kingdom uh, and, and abroad to make use of. Um, so today I'm going to go through, it, it won't really be theoretical in any way, it's going to be much more practical. I'm going to go through a bit of a history and overview of the collections and why this is an important topic for us, uh, how the collection has been built, and then what sort of items are, are gathered within the collection. And then I'm going to have a, a very practical aspect, which is about how you might find different materials, what sort of materials there are, how they're, they're listed, how they might be encountered in our, in our guides and also within our collections, um, and then um, different things that, that uh, you might want to consider as different ways of, of branching out and finding whether it's other resources um, within the library or outside of the library as well, through the gateway of the library's collections. So I'm going to start with the, the British Library collections, talk about our, our focus on LGBT issues and gender issues, and then uh, have a few different slides about different types of collections that we have, so classical categories of, of uh, collections, uh, as well as the postmodern turn, and different publications that we've collected from the 90s onwards. And then overlapping identities will give you a sense of some of the different categories um, of materials that you might find within Turkish. Uh, and finally, finding it will be those that uh, very, very practical section, uh, followed by a bit of a wrap up in terms of what we're looking to do in the coming years. The focus will be on Turkish and Kurdish because that's my specialty. At the British Library, we're divided by language. And that my fellow curators for Arabic, Persian, Hebrew, and then other languages across the Asian and African uh, spectrum and have responsibility in a similar way for their collections and are building their collections in a similar fashion. So I've tried to give a few different examples of uh, a different um, trends in those collections, um, but I'd be very happy if your area of focus, if your area of interest is not in Turkish or Kurdish, uh, to point you in the direction of the appropriate curator and to um, help you begin the conversation with them as to what sort of materials you might find in, in those collections as well. So first, uh, first off, the British Library. Um, the British Library was founded in 1753 as part of the British Museum. Um, it um, was part of the British Museum and uh, found a physical home there um, up until um, so it was part of the British Museum legally up until 1973, when an act of parliament came into force uh, creating the British Library. And then um, it had part of its home in the British Museum, part of its home elsewhere up until the 1990s when we moved to the St Pancras location. So you'll find us now beside King's Cross Station uh, in central London. We have approximately 170 million different items. That seems like an enormous number of things. And one of the reasons is because we have a lot of digital items. And um, we are the web archive since 2014 and um, by law. Uh, and so we harvest the web, the British web, once a year. And every website that is um, registered in the United Kingdom is supposed to be captured by the library in parallel to our legal deposit functions and available to people within the library's physical building. Um, for copyright reasons. So you can come to us and we will be able to provide you with different collections that are sound-based, image-based, and um, digital publishing or hard copy publishing, uh, as well as manuscripts and archives. Uh, so it's a very vast and diverse collection. Within that uh, 170 million item monstrosity, <laughs> 21,000, between 21 and 25,000 uh, items are Turkish or Turkic. So, um, we make the distinction because Turkish, I collect things from Turkey, whether they be in Istanbul, Turkish, or they're in Syriac, Armenian, uh, not, not really Armenian, but um, uh, Kurdish or other minority languages 
uh, Cherkes laws, other languages spoken within the Republic of Turkey. And then Turkic, because any Turkic language is spoken outside of, of Turkey in Eurasia. So Kazakh, Kyrgyz, Azeri, um, uh, Karakolpak. Uh, so it's a very diverse collection. Uh, it's a diverse collection in terms of language, in terms of culture, in terms of themes, in terms of uh, materials. Um, and it goes from the 8th century to the 21st, covering over 20 languages and five different scripts. So again, it's a motley collection, but brought together largely by the fact that if you can speak Turkish, you can sort of understand the other languages of the region. And the rest of the, the Asian and African sections are divided by languages, as I said. And so you do have uh, some that are specifically one particular language, like Arabic. Um, and then you have others that uh, the, the areas of uh, a focus are diverse, like mine. So the Iranic languages, if you're looking at uh, Pashto or Persian um, or some of the smaller Ossetian, that's all within the Iranic one. And then Southeast Asia, although it's geographic in focus, if you're interested in um, a number of different languages in Southeast Asia, they're all under one curator. So why LGBT issues? Uh, how did it begin? Um, as as Hakan mentioned, I'm beginning work on looking at colonial legacies within the British Library's Turkic collections. And indeed, across the library and throughout the library's history, there has been a very strong focus on what were perceived to be sort of the classical themes of Oriental studies. So there was a lot of concern about religion, a lot of concern for art and art history, and quite a bit of concern for the higher forms of literature. Uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, a, a lot that was devoted to contemporary politics, contemporary literature, contemporary uh, collections. Um, in the last few years, this has begun to change, however, and it started in 2016 with my colleague Daniel Lowe, uh, who's the Arabic curator, writing a blog post about Lebanese LGBT items and other LGBT items from the Arab world. Uh, his piece uh, looked at different items that had been collected throughout the years that either spoke to contemporary um, uh, dynamics about sexuality and gender in the in the Arab world uh, from an Arab perspective, or they were biographies, they were um, works about identity, both uh, in terms of gender and sexuality, and also cultural, linguistic, ethnic, of Arabs living abroad. Um, so it was the beginning of, of us discussing and talking about the idea of identifying these items within the collections and building a guide to them so that researchers and interested parties would be able to, to access them easily. And the next year, in 2017, it was 50 years since the partial decriminalization of homosexuality in the United Kingdom, and the library undertook a number of different activities to mark this anniversary. And one of them was creating um, a Gay UK page. So it was um, a small exhibition that was free in the front entrance hall of the library, and then also a web space that gathered all sorts of different information about um, gender and sexuality um, and non-dominant forms of gender and sexuality or non uh, sort of uh, fossilized forms or as you can tell my, my knowledge of the, the terminology suffers a bit from uh, the fact that it's not my area of study but um, essentially looking at diversity within gender and sexuality in the United Kingdom and as part of that we were asked to begin to produce guides uh, to LGBT items uh, in non-UK uh, sections of, of the library. Uh, so I wrote a, a small piece for the, um, our blog, which you can see the, the blog address is here for Asian and African uh, studies, just about some of the LGBT resources that we have from what I called the Northern Middle East. Um, it was hard to locate it, but essentially it was anything that wasn't in Arabic from the Middle East. Uh, so we had very small uh, collections in Turkish, in uh, Persian, uh, and then just identifying works that might be of interest for those studying Armenian or Kurdish that they'd be able to find, whether through websites or through other providers. And it was a very tentative step, but it allowed for the beginning of a discussion with activists and with, um, with uh, academics about how we might build uh, our collections. And so beginning in 2017, and Daniel and I undertook to really identify how we could source materials about, um, about gender and sexuality, and particularly sexuality and, and um, um, sexual diversity um, from Turkish and Arab sources. Um, so the next slide, I guess I'll do an, an NSFW um, <laughs> uh, oh, disclaimer, um, because now I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through how, what are some of those items that we either acquired or identified within the collections. Um, so 
The first were our manuscripts. These form the basis of our collections in terms of the, the heritage items. Um, and going through, we began to notice that there were things that we had always had that might speak to um, gender and, and sexual diversity, um, but had never been tagged as such. So on the right hand, yeah, it, or sorry, on the left hand side on the screen, you have the Zenon Name, uh, the Ottoman Book of Women. Um, and it's a, you might say, a, a misogynist guide to women. Um, but at the time, it was perceived to be the guide to women for Ottomans who might be interested in what were women like in different parts of the world, what are different characteristics of these women, and what are the moral, the moral lessons that can be taken from them. Um, it was featured in a blog post in 2016 and has gathered some interest um, in terms of a, an item of, of study. Um, but it is one of those items that had always been in the collection that we had realized was there that had never really been pulled up as something that, uh, rather than just looking at dress or looking at literature or looking at linguistics, we should also identify it as a separate item that should be a tag for researchers who are looking at gender and sexuality. The uh, images on the right are from the Hamsayi uh, Atayi, so a collection of uh, stories um, by Atayi, um, a, a Turkish literati, a poet and, and author. Um, they're from this, from the, this uh, item is from the 18th century. Um, and in addition to a number of historical works and works of geographic nature, you also have body tales, is how a, a one academic described them to me. Uh, quite a lot of tales that talk about sexuality and, and sex acts. Here I have one image, uh, it's, it's fully illustrated as you can see. Um, one of, of heterosexual acts, another of homosexual acts. There are discussions of masturbation, uh, of genitalia. So a lot of different material that might be of use to someone who is looking at how, how was gender, how was sex described in pre-modern Ottoman times. Um, but it was never cataloged as such. So they were simply listed as being pornographic works or pornographic images within this wonderful work of, of literature about history and geography. Um, so we realized that there's quite a lot of work if we want to tag these items, if we want to make them available um, to researchers uh, in order to allow people who might not be familiar with using these sorts of sources but have an interest in this topic to be able to access them and then figure out how they might incorporate them in their studies. And when it comes to the printed materials, it's a lot easier. <laughs> um, because the printed materials, for the most part, they've, um, they've been cataloged. Um, the publishers make it easier for you to really figure out exactly what the, um, what the content is. Um, and in, um, in the case of Turkey, there is sort of a, um, there's sort of been a, a market increase in the amount of material that's been produced over the last 30 years or so. So after the coup in 1980, um, there have been a few um, academics who, who have begun to sort of chronicle this time period when postmodern um, ideas about identity, postmodern ideas about society began to take force and there was a greater focus on identity as a whole. So particularly you see a lot of stuff about, um, about women, their role in society, their identities coming forth. Uh, and from the 90s onward, you also start to see small amounts of publications about LGBT identities, LGBTQI identities. Um, so I have here Lubunya, which is one about um, LGBT, uh, about queer identities from Turkey. Uh, we have a few other items that we started to notice um, within the collections um, that were about uh, sexual diversity and gender diversity um, that we began to tag and put in the online catalog as such. But then particularly in the last 10 years or so, there's been almost like an explosion of, of publishing. It's been great um, for building a, a, a collection. Um, and I've just put up here one particular publisher, Cell, um, because Cell has a queer edition or, or queer thought series. So they've made it quite easy um, for anyone who's looking to look at contemporary dynamics of sexuality and gender in Turkey. Uh, they're uh, very much focused on uh, translating foreign works about gender and sexuality into Turkish and also bringing out Turkish authors who write about these, these, um, these uh, works and making them available through mass mass media, uh, mass um, distribution. Um, so I've sought to acquire as many of these as possible to make them available to researchers here in the United Kingdom, um, and also to be able to bring them to the fore so that as you're beginning to search, there's sort of a critical mass um, in that even if we don't have something, now authors' names are being tagged. Now you're actually finding in things like OCLC and in other uh, resources where you might go to begin your search about gender and sexual uh, identity in Turkey, you're, you'll be able to see more and more 
uh, within English language sources, who's publishing about it, who's writing about it, what's the discussion in general. Um, so over the last few years, these have started to come into our collections as well. Um, but realizing that mass distribution is not the only means of putting out material about gender and sexuality in Turkey, um, we're also very keen on ensuring that we capture things that aren't meant for commercial audiences, that aren't meant for commercialization, and that are very much ephemeral in nature. Um, so a lot of times these are things like um, uh, pamphlets that might be produced for conferences, pamphlets that are produced for pride, that are produced for different events around Turkey, and that you can't, you just can't buy. Um, whether you're buying from a second-hand dealer or you're buying from a, so Pandora is kind of like Turkey's Amazon. Um, <laughs> that wasn't a plug. Um, so in 2017, I, I went to Turkey, I went to Istanbul, Ankara, and the Southeast, and, and was lucky enough to meet up with a number of different organizations who donated and began a process of sort of continual periodic donation of the ephemera and the items that they, they publish to the British Library. So I have here on the bottom um, three publications particularly uh, that look at things if you're, if, uh, you're interested in, for example, rights and, and the uh, recognition or abrogation of rights of um, different genders or different sexualities within Turkey, uh, freedom of expression for different uh, sexualities and genders within Turkey, um, or even sort of um, so materials that are intended for um, allies, um, for schools, for official um, bodies, and how they might interact with these communities. Um, so we've tried to collect as many of those as possible, recognizing that the political situation in Turkey might be such that these organizations are no longer able to offer them um, in as wide a format as before. And also that um, it's becoming more and more difficult uh, in, for certain people to travel to Turkey to do research. Uh, so the idea is to create a node here of these sorts of ephemeral items um, so that you don't have to you don't have to be able to go there and, and not fear um, investigation or arrest or whatever else might await you if you are uh, dealing with sensitive subjects. Um, I've also tried to continually catalog and have guides for researchers about different websites that they might use, different, um, different items that might be of interest for them that are not within the library's collections, so that they can then access those easily, so that it's kind of, again, a bit of a node um, for dissemination of information. So things like Listag, um, and Kaos Gele, and information about Queerfest, the uh, LGBT uh, film festival held in, in Istanbul every year, um, those things don't reside in the library. We're looking at ways in which we can capture them and have them as part of the web archive. It's slightly tricky because of copyright and the fact that by law we're allowed to collect British sites, but how we do that with non-British sites. Um, but in general, it's building, building that sort of uh, critical mass so that we can then allow for researchers to continue their work and, and enrich our collections in the future as well. Um, I've also been quite keen on making sure that we can have items about uh, trans communities in Turkey, um, both about their struggles and also the opportunities for expression, the opportunities for uh, community building, um, because this is something that um, within our collections, there have been a lot of discussions about how you identify trans works, how you identify a real core group of different things that researchers, stakeholders, so not just researchers, but the community itself might be able to access and find easily. Um, working with Pemba Hayat, um, which is an organization that services the trans community uh, from its uh, headquarters in Ankara, we've been able to acquire quite a lot of material, uh, and that's also sparked conversations going forward. So most recently with um, GIST, which I've forgotten the exact English um, translation of the name, but essentially a network for um, working with uh, LGBT prisoners as well. Um, so I think in general, they work with prisoners, but then they also have a smaller network uh, where they work with LGBTQI prisoners um, dealing with the, the challenges they face in, during incarceration, the products that they, they produce, um, the, the culture that they've developed within the prisons um, in order to enrich those collections and really make that visible. Um, so we know it's difficult going backwards to identify items as being trans, um, created by trans individuals or about trans situations, 
um, but going forward, making sure that those come in as trans items so that they're there and there's no question of is this or is this not. And finally, uh, in terms of the types of materials we're collecting, we also recognize that I mean, intersectionality is, is um, just as much an issue in Turkey as it is in the United Kingdom, in the United States, in Canada, in any other country, um, that issues of ethnicity, language, gender, and sexuality all overlap. Um, and to this, to this end, I've tried to make sure that we can bring in as many Kurdish items as well that might relate to gender and sexuality. It's very difficult because um, the Kurdish publishing industry and just the general situation of publishing and, and uh, distribution in, in Kurdish in Turkey is often under scrutiny, if not under sanction by the state. And um, so in the last few years, uh, so maybe like in the last five years, but ending last year or two years ago, there was an explosion of Kurdish publishing. The last year, there's been a real clampdown on it. And um, we're still getting in as much material as possible. But again, trying to collect these things because they're seen as, as endangered items. And um, so things that are very ephemeral in nature because the sheer fact that they're in a particular language, they deal with a particular community, makes them doubly vulnerable, um, being both LGBTQI items and Kurdish items. Um, so we have a few items now. We're reaching out to organizations, again, to try to get more stuff in. Um, but at the same time, again, trying to build up awareness, whether it's through archiving of the website or through just blog posts that actually list the website so it's easy to find in English, of organizations like Heavy, which deals uh, with LGBTQI issues in Istanbul, or from Istanbul, rather, for the Kurdish community, or other things um, that might speak to the Kurdish community. So, for example, Kawas Gede has its own Kurdish language uh, website where there are discussions about things like language. How do you talk about LGBT in, in, in Kurdish? What are the terms that you would use? What are the things that you might borrow from Turkish or that might have to be invented anew because there's a different identity, there's a different situation in reality. Um, so these are all sorts of very interesting things that we realize probably not gonna make their way into print media anytime soon, um, but we're trying to find ways to really bring those and, and preserve them within our collections, within our materials, uh, recognizing that they are things of, of interest to the scholarly community uh, within the United Kingdom and, and abroad as well. So having gone through a general overview of what we have and what we're hoping to, to acquire and what we're, we're hoping to build, this is slightly drier perhaps, but this is, this is the way that you might access it. Um, so I've, I'm generally going to follow the same um, path that I followed for the collection overview. Um, I'm going to start with manuscripts, and then I'm going to go through uh, printed materials, and then some digital ones. Uh, so the first with the manuscripts, um, I've called it the final frontier because it's, it's slightly counterintuitive, but although this is the core of what we were founded on, it is also the least uh, catalogued and accessible, access, uh, accessible part of our collection. <laughs> um, uh, right now, I'm guessing that we have about 30 manuscripts catalogued online, uh, out of probably about 4,000. <laughs> it's uh, it's a nervous laugh that I'm making because it's it, it's um, slightly shameful for us that we have this great cultural heritage. It is not cultural heritage that relates to the United Kingdom. So it is cultural heritage that relates to communities outside of the UK and that we seek to make available to all people around the world uh, as much as possible and particularly to those who are from communities that descend from those who created these items. And we're looking at various different ways of trying to get the, the material online. Um, when, when catalog records go online, um, you can find them at this website. It's, it's very easy actually to find if you just go within the British Library's website. Uh, I can, once I explain it, I'll, I'll take you to the website and show you. Um, but essentially, this is our repository of um, manuscripts and archives. So we have one system, um, which we know as IAMS uh, for cataloging any, anything that's done by hand or woodblock. That seems a bit of a strange distinction, um, but it's essentially so that all of the East Asian material that we have that's done by woodblock prior to metal type printing is incorporated here. Um, and that has a different set of parameters in terms of the information that's given from the printed materials from books and, and monographs and, and periodicals that are produced in a modern printing process. 
And here, what you're going to do is look for um, look for your material by a number of different um, a number of different terms, um, and they're not always standardized. So what I've done here is just on the back slide, you've got what the essentially what the search screen looks like, and I've just typed in Turkish, and it comes up with a number of different titles, and then you can go in, and each of these is a, a catalog record. And so essentially you, you use a standard search term, a, a standard common noun or proper noun, um, and that produces a number of different hits by a Boolean function. Um, and then you can click on the actual title of the work and it will bring you to the, the full uh, catalog record for the work. There's no standardized set of parameters that we have to fill in. So it, whatever the information that we have about the item is what goes into the catalog record. And that means it can sometimes be slightly frustrating. If you're looking for works particularly about sexuality or gender, you're probably not going to find anything by typing in sexuality or gender. It's a shame, but unfortunately that's sort of the stage that we're at right now. Um, so here I've done Lady Majnun, so a fairly well-known um, folktale or, or, or a literary piece from the Islamic world. Um, this is an Azeri item. Um, it doesn't necessarily deal with sexuality or gender, but at least it gives you a sense of what sort of material, what sort of information you're going to get uh, on the um, on the website. Uh, so you'll be able to get titles. If you know the title of a particular work that you're looking for, it's pretty easy to find. Uh, you'll get uh, creation dates, and you might get descriptions. So um, in the descriptions is where you might find that you're actually going to target something. You might find something that is more geared to what this topic you're looking for. Um, going to the actual website, so this is our website, bl.uk, and all it is is going into catalogs and collections and archives and manuscripts, and that's, that's how you get to the search function for archives and manuscripts. The key here is that this is also, archives also include photographs. So if your study deals with visual imagery, um, this is where you'll want to come uh, because it's where you're going to find all of the photographic evidence um, or all of the photographic items that you might want to use. Um, and here, for example, um, so if I do Istanbul and come up with the search, and for some reason, Oh, there we go. Uh, so it comes up with 1600, about 1650 uh, is the, the number of items that it comes up with. But then you can choose, and you can see here by your creation date, you can sort, sort through uh, by the material type and by any sort of tags. We're not very good with tags for, for subjects, but the tags will have things like places. So if you know that you want to do your, your research on Istanbul, on Vienna, on Stockholm, on, on um, Samarkand, it's pretty easy to narrow that, that material down, and then that hopefully should, should allow you a bit of an easier time in going through what you're looking for. Um, but then again, so maps and plans and photographs and prints and drawings, this is probably one of the richest collections that we have, and it's um, often, at least for Middle Eastern topics, one of the most underused. Um, so it's something that um, really we're hoping to have more research done on so that we also know what's in our collection so that we can then go back and sort of feed it back into the wider community in order to provide an, um, an idea as to what you might find when you're going through these types of materials. Now, as I said, only about 30 of 4,000 items actually have records here. Most of them, however, will be in various different print forms. So if you don't find what you're looking for on the website, um, you're going to have to go back to either a printed catalog or some of our internal documentation. Uh, so on the uh, top uh, left-hand and bottom right-hand corners, you see the catalogs printed by Charles Rio. If you've done manuscript research um, at the British Library and in its collections, you've probably used one of these. Um, they are guides to our early manuscript collections. So they're published usually the late 19th century, so 1888 is the one for Turkish. Uh, I think earlier 1880 might be the one for Persian. Um, 1880 about, is about the, the time for Arabic. Um, these are the bulks of the, the early collections that were acquired and then formed part of the British Museum's collections of, of Oriental manuscripts. 
Uh, they're very complete and they're very, they're very good descriptions, generally, of the items. They are from the 19th century, so the terminology is not necessarily going to match the terminology that we use today. And particularly if you're looking for things like uh, gender, uh, it's, you're going to have to think backwards and think of what sort of words would have been used in the 19th century to describe this, and that's going to be the index that you'll use. Um, because we've acquired quite a lot since 1888, um, we also have other items that are what we would usually refer to as handless or acquisition slips. So the handless are a curator going around and basically saying, OR uh, 7084 is this work, it has this many folios purchased on this date. Uh, it's very basic information, but if you know the title of what you're looking for, it can help you to find it. Alternatively, what I have in the center here is an acquisition slip. So it's the information that was given when something was purchased. And these I've digitized myself. It's sort of a homemade digitization using a scanner. And but they are accessible. And if you are interested in going through some of them to find things, it's not searchable, but you can essentially go through hundreds of pages to see what we have. And I'm more than happy to release that information to you and to allow you access to the digitized files. Uh, when it comes to printed books, so published material from usually the last century or so, and, and then also more antiquarian materials that we've cataloged in the last century or so. Um, Explore, um, which is down here, is the online guide uh, to all of our materials. This is a lot easier. Um, this actually has subjects tagged to the material. You, usually you'll find subjects. It's sort of the best practice for everyone who's cataloging them. But of course, when we started cataloging things, people didn't always add subjects. So you might have a very old record that doesn't have a subject and you'll need to know what is the, whatever the title might be. Um, here it's, it's pretty much intuitive if you've ever used a Boolean search. Uh, so you just go in, you type what you're looking for, um, and, um, and it will give you hits on everything that it contains, every record that contains that word. And then again, you can go down the side and you can narrow that down to say, oh, I only want subjects including that. I only want uh, I only want titles including it. I only want authors. And um, the good thing about this as well is if the record has original scripts, then the original scripts are in there. So I tried to find something with jins, um, so gender in Arabic, um, but uh, we don't have anything. <laughs> we have uh, we don't have anything with original scripts that would be that. We have quite a few things in Persian where jins is, is just type or sort or things like that. But it will work um, if you're looking at original scripts. And we do generally best practice now is to include the original script so you don't have to worry about knowing um, how you transliterate something according to the Library of Congress transliteration. And when you, when you pull open a, a catalog record, this is what you'll see. And so you have the title, the author, the basic imprint information. And, but what I would like to draw your attention to is just your subjects. And so that's where you, you'll find how we actually talk about what the work is about. Um, and these are a bit tricky because they, they are, um, they're, they're uh, policed essentially by the Library of Congress. So the Library of Congress has what are called authorities. And what, it, what it's actually trying to do is make sure that in the UK, we don't occasionally go between a social sex and gender. Um, and in the US, they only use gender. And somewhere else, they use a different a different search term. Rather, everyone will use gender identity um, to describe the same sort of works. Um, so sometimes they're exactly what you'll think about in terms of the type of work or the subject of the work. Sometimes they're a bit counterintuitive. Sometimes they seem a bit old-fashioned. And that's because it takes a bit of a time for the committee to get through updating the terms. And they are occasionally reticent to update them if they think that they'll miss out on something. Um, if you want to really figure out what is the exact term I should search for? If you can do that by going to the authorities, uh, so that's the website for the authorities. This is sort of, I guess, only librarian nerds might actually go to this and, and look through it. Um, but it is helpful sometimes because, for example, LGBT doesn't really come up in the authorities. So if you're looking for LGBT, you won't necessarily pull up all of the material that you're looking for. They, uh, at LOC, refine it down to items about gay men, lesbians, um, bisexuals, transgender, uh, intersex. Qu um, I don't think there's queer, there, there's sort of queer theory, but I don't think that there's queer people as a, a title. 
So sometimes it's quite good to go through and just do a preliminary search to see what are the terms that I want to use and then to come back to the, to the catalog so that you know that you're going to hit all of the things that might be of interest. And it doesn't happen with a lot of terms, but particularly ones that are more um, that are that are much more contemporary in terms of titles of, of um, uh, subjects that you've seen. You might have seen sort of a great increase in the amount of material published in the last twenty years because the terminology changes much more frequently. And that's when you'll you'll start to see that actually the the terminology that the subjects are a bit more fragmentary because. A, a core consensus on what everyone's going to call it hasn't really been formed yet. Um, and finally, uh, what I'd just like to point out is that we at the library, uh, so not finally for the finding ends, um, we at the library hold what's called Ethos, which is the electronic thesis um, online service, I think. Or, uh, so it's basically a repository of all doctoral theses um, approved in the United Kingdom or, or um, delivered in the United Kingdom. Um, these are generally uploaded within a year after um, acceptance by the university, and you can search by subject. So it's actually it's quite a good way to find if someone else has done research on this before. The some of the universities in the U.S. will actually upload previous, so way back to the, even the 50s. They'll digitize some of their their theses and upload them to the service. So it's quite a good way to find if there's something that someone hasn't published um, at a university you you're not able to go to and uh, not able to access for whatever reason. Um, and it's free and it's available through the, the British Library. I think some you might be able to access off-site, others you have to be on-site to access. So, cognizant of time, uh, I can certainly talk. Um, but just in terms of further development, we're looking to continue to build our, uh, the Turkish collections, we're looking to build our LGBT um, collections and build them into library-wide initiatives. So we're hoping to use this as we look at collections and to look at different ways of actually using this to mirror when we do acquisitions in other languages. Uh, we're looking to engage with communities and uh, with activists as well, and to leverage that for larger digital projects. Um, and so that's sort of a bit of a plug as well in that um, this is an ongoing thing. If you, thank you. Um, if you are interested in working with us in, in trying to build a particular aspect of the collections, please do get in touch. We do look to, to partner with, uh, perhaps not formally partner, but at least partner with different uh, organizations, with different activists and different academics to make sure that we have these materials um, so that others can use them, so that they're preserved, um, should they be ephemeral. Uh, and even on a, a much smaller scale, um, you can always um, suggest to the curators titles or other works that you think we should acquire. So should there be something that we're missing within the collections, um, please feel free to get in touch. Let us know what you what you think we should be buying, what we should be acquiring, and how we might be incorporating that within our collections for better usage and better discoverability for various stakeholders around the world. So thank you very much for uh, sitting through and listening for, for 40 minutes instead of 30. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have.